Good evening, everybody. A uh, very warm welcome to the last session on the second day of the ILM International uh, Conference on Responsible Management Education Training and Practice. I know we've all had a long day, and this is the last session of the day on a Friday. We were just discussing that. But then the session is uh, pertaining to habitation, uh, habitation, actually. And it is inspired by the SDG 11, which goes, make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Let me start by sharing a few interesting facts with you all. About half the humanity on the planet Earth, that's about 3.5 billion people, live in cities today. By about 2030, almost about 60% of the world's population will live in urban areas. In 2008, interestingly, for the first time in history, urban population outnumbered the rural population. This milestone marked the advent of a new urban millennium. The number of urban residents is said to be growing by nearly 73 million every year, and it is estimated that the urban area accounts for about 70% of the world's gross domestic product, and therefore has generated economic growth and prosperity for many. The world's cities occupy just about 3% of the Earth's land, but then account for about 60 to 80% of the energy consumption world over, and about 75% of carbon emissions. And another interesting fact is that about 828 million people live in slums today, and the number only keeps rising. So with mind-boggling numbers like this, there's a lot to be discussed on sustainable uh, habitation about which the SDG speaks. So when we speak of habitation that is sustainable, it encompasses a number of factors, including transportation, water, sanitation, waste management, disaster risk reduction, access to information, access to education, and capacity building. With the kind of numbers that we just had a look at, the rapid urbanization is exerting increasing pressure on fresh water supplies, on the sewage facilities, on the living environment, and, in the, and on the public health. However, the challenges that the cities face can be overcome in ways that allow them to contribute to thrive and grow while improving the resource use and reducing the pollution and poverty. So therein we have hope in terms of this SDG 11, which looks at solving some of these complex issues. To sum it up, the SDG, the targets of the SDG include ensuring access for safe and affordable housing, accessible and sustainable uh, transportation systems, and significantly reduce the number of deaths and the number of people affected by disasters, including water-related disasters. And these are a very few of the goals which are to be achieved by 2030. The future we want includes cities of opportunities for all, with access to basic services, energy, housing, transportation, and more. We have with us a very interesting lineup of speakers to speak on the different issues pertaining to habitation. We look forward to have some interesting discussions with all of them. Uh, so let me go on to uh, invite our first speaker, Mr. Amit Sinha Roy. Mr. Roy is the VP Marketing and Strategy, Global Enterprise Solutions at Tata Communications. With over 20 years of experience in the global IT industry, he defines winning strategies for Tata Communications global enterprises business in both emerging and developed geographies. This entails segmentation, targeting, and positioning for key products and solutions. In his current role, he is also responsible for building and implementing advanced business <coughs> development functions for new and complex solutions designed to achieve specific business revenue targets. He also leads the creation and implementation of relevant go-to market strategies for Tata Communications Enterprise solutions for individual regions. He has a Master of Science Honors degree in Physics and a Master of Management Studies from the Birla Institute of Technologies and Sciences, Bits Pilani, India. Sir, can we have you over? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, honorable panelists, and uh, thank you uh, for having me here. When um, Shivani reached out, uh, Oh, sorry, technology. <laughs> when we reached out over LinkedIn and talked about this uh, platform, 
I looked at looked at it uh, in, at the internet, and I saw that it's it's something that is amazing in terms of the knowledge that it shares, uh, you know, with with the folks over here, with the students, with the faculty, as well as with, of course, everyone of our speakers. I was sitting in the one of the last rows in, during the uh, previous session, and there was a lot of learning that I, I got from the session on on uh, you know on the water management. But coming to the topic at hand. Um, talking about you know inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, and coming from a technology company, obviously you know uh, one thing led to the other, and uh, you know I took the liberty of uh, calling them smart cities, right? Uh, smart cities is of course a term that is being used uh, you know universally now. In fact, in India, uh, with the government having uh, you know earmarked hundred cities, they actually named. 98 cities in August of last year. So the cities are already named. And there is an investment of uh, several billions that has already been set aside to make this real. So uh, when you introduced the topic, Joanna, you talked uh, you know, about the various aspects of you know, sustainability of, you know, and these, uh, these tie in very nicely with, if you look at what we're talking about or what is generally spoken about in a smart city concept, which is across you know, the governance, the energy, the environment, transportation, communication, smart buildings, and all of that, right? So looking at what is out there and what is available to us, it is something that we need to enable in order to make it happen, because it is not a secret anymore, right? The concept of smart cities, the services that are available, they are all very well known in the sense that it is something that is already being practiced in some of the more advanced countries. Even in our, I have some examples in the following slides. Even in India, we have solutions that are now yielding savings, be it water and power and so on and so forth in several of the states. So moving forward, um, why should we care about the smartness of the city? Now there is safety, there is you know, the fun of living, there, there is the ease of living, and uh, several other aspects of it. But talked about urbanization, and we talked about the estimated number of people who are actually moving into the, the cities. And if we actually look at the numbers that have been talked about in India over here, is that by 2050, it's going to touch 843 million people who are going to be living in these cities. In the last census that I checked, there were about 53 cities which had more than a million population in India. So maybe those numbers will increase, obviously, by 2050. But that's the kind of number that's going to move in. Now, obviously, with so many people coming into the infrastructure and loading the infrastructure in the cities, you will require systems that are beyond manual operational interventions to ensure that everything is running smoothly. So essentially, we're going to need some form of automation, some form of uh, you know, ability to connect things up, right? to make things smart in order to keep uh, you know, the facilities running smoothly. So if you look at what some of these examples um, the usage of smart meters in Mumbai has actually helped save 700 million liters of water a day, which is equivalent to what 5 million people would use in a day, right? Just look at that. Uh, smart grid technology, if we look at it in electricity, can you know, reduce the transmission losses from 27% to 2%. That's a savings of 25% without adding any new power generation plants. We can have 25% additional power, which is from the savings. Uh, it's Bangalore over here, but it's true for any city, right? We know when we're sitting out there in the traffic jam, it's non-productive time, right? Some of us do get to work on laptops and, and smartphones, but you know, typically it's unproductive time. And if we actually put a, a, do, a value dollar to it, you know, six billion dollars in a city with people just waiting in traffic rather than being able to get to work, right? So these are some examples which which actually show how these Smart city technology can actually help in making you know, in, uh, these things come, become more efficient, both in terms of savings as well as in terms of uh, the ease of living. So I talked about technology in the past in terms of how is you know, technology related to smart city. But here is where we've tried to put a framework to it. So if you look at the diagram on the left, you'll see 
that there are the end users which are right on the top. It's essentially the people who are using these services. They're the citizens, right? They're the people who live there. They're the businesses. They're also the students, right, for, for uh, uh, you know, the consuming um, technology-led courses, perhaps. Then there are the government or, or the service providers, which, which has the government bodies, the utilities, entertainment, retail zone, transportation for smart transportation, and so on and so forth. So those are the folks in the middle who are actually providing the services that the consumers are using. And then at the bottom of it, you have the system integrators, the product uh, solution vendors, the network service providers, managed service providers. So these are the technology companies and the enablers, right? So there's the enablers, there's the service providers, and there's the consumers, right? Now, if we look at it, the key element of a smart environment in a city is the ability for devices to be able to talk to each other, to be able to communicate. The term that is being used for this now is the Internet of Things, right? It's been around for a while, Smart City Internet of Things. So one of the <laughs> leaders in our company talked about Rangu Salgame, who's our EVP of, uh, of our uh, 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 GS, uh, our uh, global, uh, I don't want to use the <laughs> terms that you'll not use, but our global service provider business, is um, saying that the connectivity is the critical element that will truly enable smart cities. It links elements such as smart buildings, people, public spaces together, empowering all key stakeholders to meaningfully connect with each other. Smart cities will create a huge demand for greater number of connected things and smart devices. So if we look at it from that perspective, what are some of the deployments? So there were some examples in the earlier slide which talked about some of the successes. But here are some more deployments which are there. Of course, we talked about the smart water management, uh, there is a remote intensive care uh, you know, unit that Apollo Hospital is using in Chennai, GIS mapping of cities to improve property tax in Ahmedabad, uh, you know, in Delhi, the Delhi metro itself, ICT enabled health records in Gujarat, smart policing with messaging in, in Karnataka and so on and so forth. And the companies which are doing this you know, from a telecom perspective, Tata Communications, from a network provider perspective, Cisco and so on and so forth, there are set of companies in there who are providing the technology and the infrastructure to make these happen. So, what is a telecom like Tata Communications able to bring to the table, so it's a little bit of a sell from our side, to make this connectivity possible and therefore to be able to create and deliver smart cities? So, uh, first thing which is very exciting is the, the LoRa or what we're calling the low power wide area network technology, right? In order to have devices talk to each other, they need to be able to connect with each other and stay connected, right? So the three types of technologies that are used there, I won't get into too much detail, but essentially devices should be able to, the things, so that be it your car, your refrigerator, your mobile phone, they need to be able to talk to each other. And obviously when there's transmission and receiving going on, there is power that has been consumed. So obviously we don't want to deplete the power of our devices, so low power tech, uh, wide area network technology is something which is cutting edge right now and Tata Communications is driving that to be able to deliver the Internet of t uh, Things connectivity with l the low power wide area networking capabilities across three cities that we've started now in Mumbai, Delhi and Bangalore. Uh, we've also, working with the Gujarat government in GIFT, which is the technology city, uh, we're creating a green data center because Look at it like this, when millions of devices are talking to each other, they're generating a lot of data, right? Somebody needs to be able to store that data and be able to analyze that data and then take action on that data. Because if we are unable to take action on that data, then it is just data for the sake of collecting data, right? So data centers become critical and crucial because that allows us to store, analyze, and then have algorithms which allow us to take action on that data and that information. So, as an organization, of course, our credentials are on the right side. I won't, won't go through them. They're very easy to, for you to take a look at it. But from the perspective of um, how this will all pan out, is it is going to allow us to have the capability of having a completely connected environment, which allows us to have the ability to perhaps switch on our you know, lighting, our air conditioning at home, and so on and so forth remotely, right, which are things which are absolutely available today. 
just, you know, I'm uh, running out of time, so just uh, as, a, as a last example, the other day I was looking at a uh, microwave oven, and uh, it said Android powered on it. So I asked the, sh the you know, the, the, the person in the shop that what, what, what's Android got to do in a microwave oven? So he said it's very simple. When you open the door, there's a bar scanner inside. If you've got any frozen food, you just scan it, and the microwave is connected on your Wi-Fi. It figures out how much of heat setting it needs to cook that, that uh, package that you have, so it automatically cooks the food. You just scan the food packet and put it inside and close the door, it's done. I said, wow, <laughs> that's fine. So then, of course, you know about the refrigerators that do the auto-replenishment and so on and so forth. So these things are already available, they're happening, right? But then there are also the utilities, the power saving, the water that was talked about extensively in the last session and so on and so forth, traffic management, security, safety, uh, you know, education, healthcare, bunch of areas where you know, we can do a lot in order to actually improve the living of the people in each of these cities. So with that, let me just wrap up and thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Uh, indeed, it was a very, very interesting discussion on not just defining what smart cities are, but also speaking about how a smart system has to be in place in order to make it feasible. And it's not something, uh, a very ideal thing, but things which are actually happening by the examples that you've quoted. Thank you so much. Next, we have uh, Professor uh, Michael Schmidt from the ISM Germany. Let me introduce him. Professor Michael Schmidt received his PhD in 2012 from uh, WHU Otto Byham School of Management. I am very sorry, my German pronunciation is not very good. <coughs> Following to a professorship at uh, Hochschule for International Management at uh, Heidelberg, he is now a professor of financial management at ISM, the International School of Management at uh, Frankfurt. The ISM has campuses in Dortmund, Frankfurt, Munich, Cologne, and Stuttgart. Professor Schmidt's research focuses on mergers and acquisitions as well as sustainable, sustainability issues in the area of finance. He has published in leading international journals and is a reviewer for the journal Business Research. Further, he is the coordinator for the UN Nations, uh, United Nations Principles of Responsible uh, Management and Education with the PRM Initiative at ISM. Prior to his academic career, uh, Professor Schmidt was also associated with uh, organizations like PwC and KPMG. Uh, Professor Schmidt, over to you. So, thank you, Preeti, for this uh, very nice introduction. And I think your German pronunciation is quite uh, wonderful. So. <laughs> So, distinguished panelists, dear audience, it's a pleasure for me to speak here on this conference. And Mr. Roy, I really wanted to have such a microwave at my home, so it would ease cooking very much from myself. Okay. So, um, my topic today, I'm going to speak about fear and hope to you. So. This is um, influenced by what we have already heard um, at that conference, and I'll try to incorporate this a little bit um, in my presentation. Um, also, I want to guide you through a recent study which was performed by one of my colleagues, and yeah, let's see what it is about. So, I have put together some uh, um, thoughts about um, mega cities to become smart, and this doesn't work. <laughs> ah, okay. So I wouldn't be an academic if I wouldn't have brought some kind of definition for it. So um, with this definition, a working definition I'm going to share with you, um, I have bolded some uh, words, so human and social capital, transportation and infrastructure, and also the participatory government. These are um, aspects we had already um, in uh, prior sessions at this conference, um, which I like to point on. So, 
Um, I said fear and hope. Unfortunately, the academic part um, of this presentation would be about fear. So here it is. Um, I'm pointing um, to some research from uh, one of my colleagues, um, uh, Kai Rommel, is the uh, um, research dean on ISM, and he has authored um, a paper on consumer preferences um, on electric supply attributes, and actually um, this was from a case study in Hyderabad. So I double-checked, this is the Indian Hyderabad, so not the Pakistani one, so this is from Andhra Pradesh. So, what was the outcome of um, this um, research? They applied um, a quite clever statistical model um, to figure out customer preferences. And this model has managed to come up with four um, customer preferences which are observed um, concerning these electricity supply attributes, the customers like in Hyderabad. So, um, a little bit more on this study. So, it was a discrete choice element, um, which is done by such choice cards. You just hand those choice cards over to the participants of the survey, and um, then here you go with a scale adjacent Latin class log logit model. Um, this is going to work it out for you. So they have asked um, almost 800 urban households in Hyderabad, and let's see what um, the model finds um, concerning customer preferences. I'm going back. So the biggest group was the cost-sensitive conservatives. So what does that mean? Conservatives refer to that consumers don't want to change the distributor of um, energy supply. So the option was, should it be distributed by government organizations or should it be uh, um, on private sector? Um, organizations, and therefore they said, no, don't change anything, so um, government um, is quite, governmental is quite right. And, of course, they are named um, cost-sensitive because um, they were not willing to pay anything more, um, even if it has less power cuts and more renewable energy in it. Um, the second largest group is the indecisive layman group. So up to 40% um, of the uh, interviewed households were indecisive. So um, no specific preferences um, for whatever reason. You hardly can analyze um, th their preferences then. The um, third largest group are the green conservatives. So green conservatives are still conservative in terms of um, the distributor, but they want to have more renewable energies. But unfortunately, this group accounts only for around about 5% of all um, the interviewed households. And fourth, there have been counter-green reformers. Counter-green reformers are those um, who opted for private distribution um, of energy, but um, they don't want um, to have more renewable energy, but whatever um, probably nuclear um, power plant generated energy in it. So, um, what can we learn from this? So, the first two groups, so the cost-sensitive conservatives and the indecisive layman, they were not willing to accept any tariff hikes. Um, so they were not willing to pay more, um, even if power cuts are reduced or um, more renewable energy is, um, is used to generate the energy. So only the 10% um, are willing to pay for improved quality. And unfortunately, it can be any worse hardly, that these 10% are the green conservatives together with the counter-green reformers. So you, whatever you do, more or less renewable energy, you would lose the other group. Yeah? So, and unfortunately, you would end up with only 5% of the households willing to pay more for renewable energy and um, a better quality. So 
this is um, yeah some kind of uh, uh, um, result that um, brings us back to the ground. So um, is it really the case that customers really um, want to have what we propose on conferences? So the only thing um, I have hope for is that this study here was done, the survey actually, um, was done in 2010, so quite an old database here. So my hope is that one of the implications that um, would be drawn for this is um, that customer preferences has changed or are about to change. Because um, how can you um, improve the energy mix if um, you're trying to work against the customers? That wouldn't work. So, actually, um, the only thing um, which is good about these adverse uh, events we are all facing, like smog and um, perceived global warming and odd and even measures and so on, I think this is that um, these events have an effect on customer preferences. And while changing customer preferences, or while trying to slowly change customer preferences, you would have um, a very important stakeholder group which you need to take with you um, to um, improve the situation here and therefore um, to um, get a city into the direction of becoming a smart city. So, um, this was part of the fear, so because these results have been rather daunting, um, but yeah, let's see. Um, I won't let you go uh, with just fear uh, in this evening. Um, I have certainly um, had some incidents for hope, and that's what I want to link to the um, definition I gave earlier. So. The investment in human and social capital. So from day one here, from session one yesterday, well, we have learned that education has a very high value in India. So I can remember the session on schooling, which um, was really amazing. So therefore, this might be, um, yeah, or Indians are aware, obviously, of the high value of education, and that's basically um, what is perfect basis for hope. So we have also heard about transportation. So there is no new public, there is new, not no, there is new public um, transportation um, building, so the new metro line to Gurgaon, there are um, private business model for shuttle services and so on, which um, Mr. Um, Nitin Seth um, was reminding to. So these are all projects um, which brings us more into the direction of smart cities, and that's definitely something um, that's going to pay off in the future. And um, it is all um, about infrastructure. So, um, Mr. Roy, we have now learned what infrastructure is um, capable of, especially with the Internet of Things. And um, what also gives me hope is the high usage of um, mobile services by Indian customers in general. So, um, we have pointed to that um, for the issue of um, mobile banking services on a paper. Um, which I co-authored together with Taruna Gautam from uh, um, ILM in Greater Noida campus. So probably, um, yeah, we're going to be able in due course to uh, um, share a paper with you. Um, and also the participatory, um, participatory government um, is the Car Free Tuesday in Gurgaon, which I have learned about. Um, I also know a car-free Tuesday from my hometown, Frankfurt in Germany, but this is the Tuesday night skate, so therefore you're going to be on skates then through the city and police is keeping the uh, streets clear of any cars, so that's quite fun. Um, also, we have heard about um, the role models, which are really important here, and again, Mr. Seth had pointed to 
um, a position where the um, police governor was also there to make this Car Free Tuesday um, happen, and therefore that's also definitely um, pointing into the correct or uh, into the uh, um, right direction. And what also gives me hope is this conference. So um, I guess, well, I have pointed to education and um, so many students being there and exposing themselves to um, the issues which are discussed here. So this definitely gives me hope. And um, what I can tell you is um, basically you're not alone in there and you keep on that track because also in Germany we have some very um, yeah, cool um, student initiatives which are um, governing th to this um, important issue. So I have been asked also to just tackle a bit the German um, perspective um, on smart, not only smart cities, but um, on PRME and on responsible management education. So um, we as ISM, we have just recently became um, a partner in the uh, um, PRME initiative, um, but um, this is more um, something that um, is, yeah, with mixed feelings. We are only one out of 26 German participants out of 428 German universities. So that's quite a low number. And um, what you can see if you go through the signatories here is that this is very much driven by the private universities. So it's not the state-owned. The state-owned universities are really slow on um, issues like that. Um, and therefore, um, I think, and that's also my, my true belief, that this is almost, um, no, not, not almost completely, but um, it is very much demand-driven. So if you as students or your, um, your parents, um, which may consult you on um, the choice of a master um, student's program or something, if they ask questions like, okay, University XYZ, where's your responsible management education part? So this is something um, which definitely pushes this um, project forward. And therefore, I think, um, demand-driven um, change is here something which is definitely one of the driving factors. So I said, um, dear students, you're not alone. Um, also in Germany we have um, some uh, very interesting um, student initiatives. So this is a student initiatives for the Halt Prize. I don't know um, if you're familiar with the Halt Prize. The Halt Prize is founded by the Clinton Foundation and it has the message like um, how, gonna you how you're going to change the world with one million dollar. So one million dollar is the prize that you receive for the winning concept. Yeah? Um, so this is a startup financing then. And um, I guess our students are as vibrant as your one. So um, these students, um, they made it um, to the, right away to the regional finals in London with a really cool concept here, which is um, described by the team Interchange. So Interchange is the winning idea here. And they have thought about connecting poor and less poor people um, in a city um, and um, making their needs or matching their needs together. So they say, well, on the one side, um, the um, richer people looking for very individual things um, so not just that clothes that we can uh, shop everywhere at H&M or whatever. Um, and probably these uh, are more handcrafted. So they are uh, then produced at smaller shops. But the problem is to match those. So the preferences from um, the richer consumers um, to the uh, um, supply of the producers, which uh, are smaller. Um, companies here. And they have um, found some cool thoughts about that. 
And um, therefore, I'm really keen um, how they're going to do at the regional finals. So um, I guess those student initiatives, um, I do know academia is um, very important. We're, we're going to judge you on your academic um, level and your academic record. Yes, that's true. But being part in such a, a student initiative is um, something which um, drives you for life. And therefore, um, I can only encourage you to um, take part and to participate in such student initiatives. So, um, hopefully, um, that's it for now. Um, I say vielen Dank which is thank you in German. And yeah, I'm happy to take your questions after the uh, um, other speakers have been through. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. It was very interesting indeed to uh, listen to the conversation between uh, the ideas between the mega cities becoming smart cities and then the hide and seek uh, games that we all play between fear and hope. And then thank you also for throwing light on the people's psyche when you discussed for uh, the cost sensitive conservatives and the green conservatives. And we're very, very happy that the conference that we're right now holding is turning out to be a big hope. Thank you so much for that. Uh, next in line, we have uh, Mr. Mika Vikas Marwa. He is the Chief Marketing Officer at Solana Koyo Steering Limited. If I can briefly introduce him before he takes over. He joined the Sona Group of Companies as the Chief Marketing Officer in the year 2012. The Sona Group of Companies is one of the Indian pioneers in, Indian, uh, in automobile component industry manufacturing steering systems, gears and propeller shafts. Mr. Varva, who has been credited with the launch of several brands in his career, is responsible at uh, Sona Group for corporate branding and driving new business uh, initiatives in the fiercely competitive auto component industry. He carries an experience of 22 years across diverse manufacturing and service domains, having handled business development, marketing, and operations areas. Prior to joining Sona Group, he worked at the Hertz India, Oryx, and Sixth in the capacity in the capacity of the business head. He has large experience in the Indian. Uh, Tire industry, having headed the brand function at JK Tire. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Marwa, for being here. Over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good evening to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Preeti, and uh, I'm happy to be here with the respected panelists. It's been a pleasure listening to Mr. Smith and prior to him to Mr. Roy. Uh, they bring tremendous value on the table in terms of whatever good work that they are doing in terms of their own contribution to building the smart cities, the subject that I would be addressing here. So I come here as a representative uh, from the auto component and I would say uh, automobile manufacturing setup. Uh, we believe that uh, we are uh, one of the proposed important contributors to the entire concept of smart cities when they finally come up looking at India. Uh, they are already there in many places in the world. So I represent a position of a tier one manufacturer today. Uh, we are not an OEM, uh, so we are not car manufacturers. But yes, we are a part of an ecosystem uh, that is responsible for finally getting to you a product that would hopefully be smarter in the future. So I am trying to correlate this presentation, uh, which is a little small in visual content, uh, with the best practices in the manufacturing sector, and especially in the automotive domain that we do, and how we can replicate them into building the smarter cities of future. So the contents of the presentation that I'll be talking about here relate to the manufacturing industry, the philosophy, and the use in terms of designing of a smart city. Uh, especially pertaining to my core area, the evolution of vehicles for the smart cities that we hear about. We hear about the Google self-driving car. We hear about the autonomous driving, the ADAS uh, features that would be there. 
we talk about the science fiction movie stuff that uh, we have seen and we have heard all about and the self docking pods and everything and uh, the vehicles going in different directions all humanless but uh, trust me i'll be trying to get you closer to the reality uh, what else we need in addition to futuristic automotives spending a couple of minutes on the manufacturing industry the image that comes to the mind when you talk about the manufacturing industry is this worker here busy on a machine this is the mental picture that comes to us in terms of a factory it has moved on from there over the last several decades so the small m the man here has moved on to the bigger m which is all encompassing and it now it's all about man material method and machine this is what happens in the manufacturing sector which is not only confined to just getting a raw material putting it in a machine and waiting for the final product there's an entire gamut of functions that gets into smart manufacturing and smart manufacturing is something which can replicate itself closer to building the smart cities of the future i am sure that there are a lot of learning from the service industry as well i have spent a good time there in the service industry and while they still continue to be dependent a whole lot on the human interface the technology being there the chances of error that can happen in a service industry to a chances of error that can happen in a manufacturing kind of setup they are completely different at manufacturing today the world is moving on to closer to a zero defect philosophy so you just cannot have a situation where in spite of having a 3g network or a 4g network today with the connectivity breaking down at various points what you call them as the blind spots those kind of things are just not acceptable today in the manufacturing setup you pay for something you are going to get the basics to as close to 100% as possible so this all includes uh, things like what you see a smart supply chain management at a global level continuous improvements and this is where we have a lot of respect for the japanese system of manufacturing kaizen that we hear so kaizen is a buzzword for the manufacturing sector which means continuous improvement continuous improvement in the manufacturing processes and continuous improvement in the way we want to live our lives a product design which is extremely important product development and this of course largely supported by by the people who are responsible for bringing ICT like Mr Roy here so ERP and ICT play a important role what we would like to include here is that this entire definition of inclusive safe resilient and sustainable is not complete without the word efficiency coming into it so the emphasis on the word efficient here that we would like to put to complete the scope of the entire objective that we need to be having in terms of building a smart city so the main slide we have heard about uh, in manufacturing it's all about sqdc what we call it each and every process each and every product development everything in the manufacturing sector smart manufacturing i would like to again emphasize is approached on the parameters of safety quality delivery and cost till the time we have a healthy mix of sqdc the entire product proposition does not come into play for this all the good companies what they do and the best manufacturing philosophies now put morale on top of it till the time the morale driven by the people the people within that ecosystem is high the sqdc are not getting delivered this arc that you see here this pertains basically to auto manufacturing it would be true of a daimler it would be true of volkswagen it would be true of toyota it would be true of an indian company like maruti and it would be true of a one of the largest tier one suppliers to maruti like us at sona so morale from the people safety safety is paramount in fact in all the business presentations and all the business reviews and everything that starts in all the japanese company and we are proud to say that uh, uh, we draw a manufacturing philosophy from our japanese collaborator and partner uh koyo which is a part of jtech corporation a toyota group company in fact we are the only company in the world uh, i would be happy to share which has a stake from toyota as well as suzuki so both these companies together get us our uh, best manufacturing practices safety is paramount the first presentation that starts in any business review any business said it starts with number of accidents reported 
that is something which is completely non-negotiable. We do a lot of stuff around predictability. We live in an uncertain world. There could be a whole lot of things that could be going wrong. We make safety critical components. If we make steering systems, and uh, just for everybody's benefit, when we talk about steering systems, my product is a product which uh, everyone knew out here in the room, when you get into an automotive in your car, the first contact point for you is the steering system. That is what is in your hands. And I'm not talking about the wheel. The wheel is decorative. Although the wheel also, with all due respect, it has gone out from the older concept on to becoming a smart wheel where you have got all the autonomous controls on the wheel. But we are the steering system and everything, the linkages that are going down under, that are controlling the entire vehicle, including the electronic or the hydraulic power assist that is coming to the steering system. So we are a product which has to be as close to zero defect as possible, operating in a PPM factor, I would say parts per million defect rate of close to two or three or four. So we just cannot afford to go wrong. So there's a whole lot of predictability that we have to build into our design, into our content, into our approach, into the final making of the product, into our processes, and to work out 1,000 plus scenarios in our head on the basis of well-defined algorithms, on the basis of well-defined load test, crash test, all kind of testing mechanisms, all kind of abuse that can get into the making of the product to make a hypothesis that where all can you go wrong and then deliver the final product. We have to be efficient, so we have to be able to control the variables in the process. The variables can come in the form of thousands of other components, including the road feel, including the pressure or the impact coming in from tires or from other kind of components that get into the making of the entire vehicle, which will finally have a bearing on the system. And then, of course, we have to be durable and sustainable, and that is where cost becomes important to us. We cannot afford to have any cost overruns. The gestation period for us and the cost budget for us are paramount. So we cannot have a situation where there are huge cost overruns. Coming quickly then to what is our connect with the entire smart city concept. So that is where the smart city concepts can become important. Involvement of stakeholders in the process, that's the citizenship involvement is extremely important. Like we involve our people, our workers, and we invite Kaizen activities from them. Safety, in terms of disaster management, waste management, working out various scenarios in your head, how it is important. There are a whole lot of other things, but let me just spend one full minute here on FMEA. This is a failure mode effect analysis. And it is extremely important that we put into the manufacturing sector. It works around three parameters, basically, which is the occurrence of the event, the severity of the event, and what is the determination point of that event. Take an example of an earthquake. We will work out the risk priority number. That, in terms of the risk priority number, what is the probability or what is the occurrence probability of that earthquake to happen? What is the severity? How, what kind of a score on a scale of 0 to 10 you would like to assign to it? Then in terms of the determination point, can you ascertain when it is going to happen? Maybe close to 0 or close to 1 or close to 2, unless there are proper seismic indicators that are available. On the basis of this, the entire city or the entire ecosystem should then be, or there could be one method of approaching this, could be doing the FMEA analysis here and assigning the risk priority score there which then becomes your focus area in terms of the disaster mitigation. So as you see, the best practices of the manufacturing sector in all these kind of cases can well be replicated here. I'll be happy to leave the presentation here and they can be copied or, uh, I mean, they can be shared or I'll be happy to individually mail it to you. In terms of the intercity generation of support services, schools, hospitals, what kicks in where? If event A happens, what is the mitigation plan? What is plan B? The entire philosophy of this slide, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is around the mitigation planning, around disaster management, and around our plan B, right? We just cannot afford to have a situation where things can go wrong, because while smart city may be a buzzword, but in terms of a smart city, it can neither be populist, nor you can just have a social plank on an, or a morally conscious plank on your mind. You have to have an entire foolproof business model around it. On my industry, what is happening? This is the vehicle of the future. The image is not ours. The image is from the internet. But yes, the smart mobiles of the future, they will have a two-way ICT connectivity. They will be receiving information in terms of the vehicle data, in terms of the maps, information, safety speeds, in terms of what is happening, speed limits to be monitored from the system, 
We still rely a lot on the Google Maps. But at the same point of time, there is a vehicle from the data that is getting relayed back in terms of the emission, fuel consumption, acceleration, and everything, which is then getting back into the system and then helping make the better algorithms for the next set of vehicles that is coming onto the road. Let us accept this. These are hard facts. There is going to be a continuous domination of the internal combustion engine that you see today. Be it diesel, be it petrol, gasoline, BS3, BS4, BS5, we have heard that the government is accelerating it to, to BS6. That goes on, ladies and gentlemen, till 2025. Nowhere in the near future we are moving on to the hydrogen cell or the biofuel technology or the stated mission that gets 6 million electric vehicles on the road by 2020. Maybe doable, but then there might be a huge concentration of two-wheelers there. The automotive industry is moving very fast, but it will still be about five to seven years that you see a 5% kind of a penetration in terms of the e-mobility. Powertrain electrification is happening. Uh, in fact, uh, the Toyota Group uh, MD recently stated that it would take a Nobel Prize winner to churn out a, a battery that really meets the 100% requirement today in terms of an electric vehicle. You cruise shorter distances, and the charging time is high. That is a real situation in which we are living in. There are companies like Tesla doing a whole lot of important work in that space, but it's still a little away. Meanwhile, what the manufacturers can do, and people like us, we are getting into lightweighting solutions. A lot of aluminum content and carbon fiber content is coming into the vehicles now from component manufacturers like us. We are trying to make the vehicle lighter so that the energy requirement that is required for the vehicle turns out to be lesser and therefore in turn the fuel requirement is lesser and therefore the lesser greenhouse gas effect that happens. And increased use of sensors. Uh, at SONA we are working at the advanced driver assist system. Uh, we'll be happy to show, we are not ready to commercially showcase it to the world but uh, we are happy to individually show in our factories. We are working on automated system, we are working on driverless vehicle technology, we are working on a steer by wire. And that is something that you still see in the science fiction movies, probably elimination of the wheel completely, the, the steering wheel completely from your hands. So we are working on all those solutions in terms of uh, helping to make lane assist, lane departure, lane changing and automated parking more realizable in the future. And that is something which the companies like uh, Bosch as a world leader coming from Germany, um, the auto component manufacturers like us and a couple of other groups in India and then in Japan. So that is how we are fitting into the entire ecosystem to be able to roll back these solutions to the OEMs or the car manufacturers, as you say, to become an important part of the smart mobility. <coughs> Automobile will be a part of smart cities. Uh, the vehicle penetration, the car penetration in India is today about 18 cars per 1,000 people. It is one of the lowest in the world for a country of our size. It's closer to 800 in US, it's closer to 150 in China, it's closer to 400 out there in Germany and in UK. But can we afford to get those many number of cars on road? Probably not seeing our land crunch and considering that the entire load is on the major five, seven, eight cities. There are 100 smart cities that are proposed to be built. Uh, probably later than 2030, they do come into being. But as of now, the load is very much going to be focused on the top 15 cities of the country because you also have to build a healthy ecosystem in terms of employability of the people who move into these cities. So the rapid transport system here becomes extremely important in terms of an integrated modular transportation network, which would be a mix of walking, taking the car, biking, and then the metro and the trams. These need to be then finally connected. We heard about the word connectivity here from Mr. Roy also here. They need to be finally connected to bring in an amount of predictability that you would then bring into the final smart city solution. Thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you so much, Mr. Marba. I think we should definitely all uh, look at adding the adjective efficient to how we define smart. And uh, also we should try and get in smart business models in order to make anything smart work. Thank you so much once again. The last speaker for the day is uh, Ms. Shabnam Siddiqui. She's the project director at Global Compact Network India. She's an academic practitioner having 18 years of experience in gender, peace, and governance work, of which eight years have been exclusively focused on anti-corruption work. She's completed her coursework towards a PhD in public policy from the National University of Singapore. Workstation has primarily been India, 
with short term and long term stints in Pakistan, France, United States and Singapore for Ms. Siddiqui. Thank you so much for having come here. And she was with uh, us here the last year also for the conference, in fact. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think it's fun to be the last speaker of the day on the second day of a three-day conference where you think that you've already crossed the cutting edge mark. Uh, smart cities, uh, the present, okay, sorry. Uh, just a bit about uh, the Global Compact. I know uh, Prime is an initiative of the UN Global Compact, so that kind of background is, is already uh, exists within the organization. Uh, so the Global Compact, uh, it was established in 2000 under the you know, initiative of uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, then Secretary General. Uh, the basic agenda behind the Global Compact was that uh, since business is a part of the problems that society is facing globally, business has to be a part of the solution. And it was in the year 2000 that uh, the Compact uh, started with nine principles around three issues of human rights, labor, and uh, environment. However, till 2004, not much uh, headway was uh, done in terms of uh, realization of uh, goals towards the principles. And it, it was in 2004 that uh, the 10th principle of anti-corruption was put into place. Uh, needless to say, since then, uh, there has been uh, a very strong momentum uh, of work that the Compact has seen throughout the world. Uh, the UN Global Compact currently exists in uh, 162 countries uh, and has more than 12,000 uh, members. Uh, members are predominantly business houses uh, and uh, a lot of civil society organizations also. In India, the Global Compact Network was established as a legal entity, as a, another Soci Societies Act. So it's an NGO registered in 2003. And since then, we have been implementing all the uh, 10 principles in India. Almost uh, most of the uh, bigger PSUs, uh, the private sector businesses, are Global Compact members and actively uh, implement the 10 principles in India. Uh, the work on anti-corruption in India uh, began in 2011 under the Siemens uh, Integrity Initiative project that started uh, all over the world in 2011. Uh, it's a 15-year, three-phase uh, program that's uh, simultaneously working in more than uh, 60 countries. So India is one of them. Uh, the idea behind uh, collective action for anti-corruption was just to get the major players together. Uh, and to deliberate on uh, transparency challenges and best practices so that there's uh, co-learning. Uh, what we as the Global Compact try to do is to create a business case for uh, anti-corruption. Uh, so for it's, it's for the first time that uh, we have put figures to uh, anti-corruption tools of what kind of profits and margins uh, transparency can lead to for uh, business houses. Uh, we also worked with the, uh, we work with the different high commissions, so we have worked with the British High Commission on uh, promoting uh, transparency, uh, the tool of integrity pact, which is basically uh, a tool of the uh, transparency international uh, globally. And since a uh, large part of our members come from uh, the oil and gas sector, we have looked at uh, implementing transparency measures in the oil and gas industry uh, in 2014-15 last year. Based on the learnings of uh, these two uh, initiatives, it was uh, felt that anti-corruption activities cannot, two things, cannot be a one-time uh, uh, initiative. There has to be some kind of hand-holding because challenges come up on a daily basis. And secondly, the 10th principle is just a one-sentence thing saying that business should work against all forms of uh, corruption, including extortion and bribery. But how do you operationalize this was the challenge. So what the Global Compact India has done is that in this year, like, uh, not this year, sorry, 2015, last year, uh, in March, we established uh, the Center of Excellence for Strengthening Transparency and Ethics in Business uh, with three uh, major objectives. One is uh, to develop pragmatic approaches towards the principle, because how does the pr principle uh, operate in uh, emerging economies like India? Uh, we provide a, a neutral platform to business and other stakeholders uh, to learn from each other because we are not technical experts at the Global Compact. My background degree is in sociology, peace studies, and public policy. So I believe in uh, transparency, the value of transparency, and that it can gain profits. But the actual learning comes from the industry themselves. And of course, all learnings, all challenges, all best practices have to feed into the larger uh, national framework. 
because otherwise they get lost into individual activities. So that's what the Center of Excellence uh, is uh, intending to do, has started doing. Uh, the various things that generally a Center of Excellence offers, research, uh, knowledge, dialogue, uh, best practices, policy change. Uh, but the reason that we are here is uh, this entire smart city uh, initiative. I think uh, we have heard a lot of uh, earlier discussions on what goes into the smart city. And uh, adding to what uh, Mr. Maru was saying, uh, along with efficiency, what we are trying to include into the smart cities is the word uh, transparency. Uh, we know that uh, globally a lot of uh, number of in uh, like technological innovations, interventions, everything has happened. Uh, Things work beautifully everywhere else, but uh, when you come to countries like India, and India is not the only one, we are somewhere in the middle uh, in terms of uh, being uh, corrupt and transparent, is that uh, things, the best case studies that could work globally will face its toughest challenge in India. And what happens, uh, why that happens is where this project is helping out. Uh, so what we have done is, uh, out of the 98 uh, smart cities that the government has uh, uh, like shortlisted, uh, the Global Compact Network has started work in 10 cities. So we are seeing 10th principle in 10 cities. Uh, we have tried to take a cross-section of cities uh, throughout the country uh, to represent as many uh, states as possible. And our focus is on uh, business-intensive cities. So there might be cities for which tourism uh, is also a major factor of business, but that will not for get, uh, has not, not gotten a place in our uh, initial selection. Uh, what we are essentially doing, like the features of the smart city, I think that uh, people uh, generally have read about uh, in uh, the public domain, uh, mixed land use, housing and inclusiveness, uh, workable localities, reduced uh, congestion, better traffic control, greening, IT, like generally whatever you think that is smart innovations. Uh, the deliverables uh, that most, so uh, I don't know if you know of the process, but the 98 smart cities have all submitted uh, uh, their uh, plans. Uh, most plans have been prepared by a number of international consultants. And uh, if you see the plans, even though there has been a lot of uh, surveys and inclusive participation in terms of uh, social media used, uh, most plans could be a lot of copy-paste from what happens in developed countries and what could happen in Indian cities. What has not been taken into account is if you go to the 98 cities that has been chosen, those are not the ideal grounds to implement uh, a lot of the very fascinating ideas which could bear results elsewhere. So through the Global Compact, what we are doing is we are actually going to the cities, at least the 10 cities to start off with, we are looking at uh, infrastructure challenges. We are looking at uh, challenges of uh, ideation. We are looking at challenges in the government uh, uh, machinery also. So we are facilitating discussion locally. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, we are very happy to share that in most of the cities that we are going, we are tying up with management institutions because they are the neutral ground on which we can call all stakeholders. And they facilitate the discussion. Uh, and uh, we are trying to develop a network of people throughout the country that can actually have uh, a say and informed decision into where their cities uh, should progress. Uh, I'm not sure if you have managed to tra travel to any of the smart cities, but because we are doing the rounds, there's a, like, there's a very strong momentum in the cities. People have uh, that feeling of uh, both national pride and state pride and city pride is visible on the roads, in the banners, everywhere, but not exactly where the entire concept is uh, lo local. It's a Ministry of Urban Development initiative, so all decisions will be vested uh, with the MOUD and the local governance uh, machineries. We have the businesses, uh, both public and private sector uh, uh, organizations that are working there. Civil society in terms of business associations, uh, eminent citizens who have seen the city uh, develop or face challenges over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Academic institutions and media. Most of these cities, uh, as of now, uh, the budget that is there is uh, peanuts. Uh, so in that budget, nothing uh, could actually uh, even be, a thought process cannot be initiated. Forget about an actual, uh, uh, like, you know, intervention. So there will be a lot of uh, uh, public-private partnerships. And uh, a wait and watch policy has been, is been going on with a lot of number of businesses. Except for big cities like Pune and others, which have already attac attracted uh, foreign investment. And of course, UN and other organizations uh, uh, will all join hands to monitor and uh, to handhold and to guide. Uh, some initiatives that we uh, are even discussing in uh, 
the places is that, uh, for example, if you see the case of Kochi IT project, and this happens everywhere, that big projects, uh, land taken uh, very cheaply, uh, much, much, much below the uh, market value, and uh, if there's promoters and there is uh, middle people, then we don't think we can get the same results at the end of it. And in Nasik, uh, uh, a smart city app has been launched uh, which talks about active uh, citizens' participation. I have certain issues with active citizen participation also because when we participate many a times, we do not, it's not an informed participation. It's just we uh, see a lot of uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and other posts and uh, try to replicate those things in our uh, arenas, which might or might not work. So the possible entry points, and this is where we are focusing on, is uh, whether we can develop a due diligence uh, framework for the smart cities, right from the point of when the actual plan starts. So the projects have been, the plans have been uh, sent to the MOUD. Uh, around the 26th of January, the government uh, is uh, supposed to announce 20 of the 98 smart cities for initial round of funding. I think they're now debating whether they will announce 20 or 10. Uh, to see which works best. Then, uh, because a lot of procurement will happen, and procurement is a major source of uh, corruption uh, anywhere in the world, we are trying to see if we can put up red flags uh, uh, for city administrations for uh, people to monitor, uh, to see that there is transparent pro uh, procurement happening. We will be developing a risk analysis mitigation exercise in place for the uh, local establishment, uh, so for the government uh, agencies to look at high risk, low risk uh, uh, areas and what kind of controls are required. Uh, and mostly promoting uh, something like an integrity pact, integrity pledge, which binds people in a fair binding uh, bidding uh, process. And these are not uh, uh, things that are uh, very difficult to understand because uh, most businesses in India, whether there is a PSU or a private sector enterprise, is already doing a lot of good practice, uh, has a, a good practices in place both in terms of procurement and in terms of uh, uh, value chain, uh, supply chain uh, management. So what we are trying to do is uh, build up a policy paper, uh, get the businesses on uh, ground. For example, Gale has uh, something called the bill watch system, which other some other companies might have also, where they have uh, completely canceled out interaction with vendors. So there's no human interface. And there's a watch, uh, the payment system initially started with a 15-day uh, payment uh, 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 like uh, confidence that the vendors will get paid, and now they have brought it down to seven days, which basically means that in every uh, major project, there is at least a 15 to 35 percent of uh, profit margin that comes into place, because uh, most uh, money is lost in delays and in human interface and uh, uh, those kind of enterprises. ONGC uh, uh, and IOCL have uh, very strict uh, uh, integrity pact. They have. Uh, monitors, uh, independent external monitors that guide them in terms of disputes. So something like that, if it can come in the smart cities. Because as we all know, once money starts changing hand uh, uh, in any kind of development, uh, then having a scam afterwards, investigation afterwards, does, will not have as much uh, impact as any kind of preventive vigilance at the start. So UN Global Compact, uh, because of its uh, uh, like reach within the businesses within the country uh, because we also know about a lot of positive practices that businesses are doing. Uh, so, uh, some companies have excellent gift policies, some uh, companies, uh, the vendor management framework is excellent in the private sector. So we're trying to see how much of it can we uh, get into the guidelines. And uh, I think the first place that we are starting is uh, even the selection of uh, SPVs, the special purpose vehicles that will monitor the entire smart city plans that the selection of the SPVs itself is transparent, it's monitored, and that uh, civil society and uh, people uh, and organizations like us uh, can get involved and uh, play a crucial role, because eventually any smart governance is about responsible governance, and we cannot demand uh, uh, accountability afterwards if we have not been uh, aware citizens before. So that is what we are uh, trying to do at the Global Compact Network India. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, and uh, reiterating the role of uh, UN Global Compact in the entire thing. Uh, now, if we can have a question answer session, probably one question can be taken. I know we are uh, actually running out of time, but maybe one question with the permission of everybody. Yeah. 
Yeah. This is a general question. Uh, uh, since uh, uh, smart cities uh, involve transportation as the basic uh, need for building them and sustaining them, do you think that uh, drastic measures like the odd even rule need to be put in place? Or uh, making people more proactive is a better option? So, um, also as a general answer, <laughs> um, I would say um, in my presentation I um, mentioned that customer preferences um, play a crucial role here. And um, if you don't get customer preferences changed, then you would not achieve anything. So, despite the, uh, um, yeah, harm that an odd and even uh, rule would do to some stakeholders. Um, I guess it's still the case that it um, increases attention and awareness and thereby customer preferences may be changed. So um, otherwise this is, um, yeah, useless in, in terms that um, nobody would, um, st and would change their preferences and would stick to the cost-sensitive um, measure. So, therefore, that might be one effect. I think the, I just, I wanted to, uh, yeah, I think now it should be okay. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add to it, like, uh, any new idea, any new scheme is always a challenge because uh, uh, we are used to thinking in a particular manner, so it's difficult to adjust. And uh, I don't drive, so uh, it, uh, the, uh, th like for me, the uh, Uber and everything else is like a boon in general. But what I also realized was that we sit in Scope Complex, which is like very near to this campus. It's a big uh, conglomerate of public sector enterprises. I've been sitting on this particular floor for the last five years. And it is such a uh, intricate system, the scope complex is like almost like a, a maze. So you don't know who else works on the floor. And we were very surprised, uh, me and my team, that uh, just a week, the last week of December, before uh, the scheme came into place, we suddenly saw one woman uh, walk into our office, asking, actually asking who works where and who has what car. And I just found it so fascinating that something like this, like five years I've not seen, like if you had shown me that woman anywhere uh, in that entire area, I would not have recognized her. But people in scope complex, and you have to believe that these are uh, a lot of uh, government uh, offices, uh, cars driven by drivers and sirs and madams, single person coming from like bizarre places and occupying the streets. So it's not only about driving, but occupying all the streets and parking in no parking areas and everything else. And suddenly, if you come now to the scope complex area, it is open and you realize that it's a wide road. So I think some, uh, sometimes uh, drastic uh, uh, cases call for uh, drastic measures. It seems to be working now, but uh, this cannot be the thing that changes the entire status quo. It's all about customer preferences. It's all about whatever uh, else you learn in the management. But I think any strategy that works for good governance and helps the city breathe better, like today is the first day, I think, uh, like yesterday also, but we actually had fog in Delhi. And I've been missing the uh, Delhi fog. I'm from Bombay, so I've loved the Delhi fog. This is the first year that there was no fog. So I think it works, but I think we'll have to be more patient, we'll have to be more open ourselves. And we have to accept changes and we have to also suggest changes because most innovative ideas should come from the young population, the kind of theories and uh, strategies and practices that you learn uh, would be a good bet. So I think wait and watch would be best. I, I was only thinking, uh, why should there be drastic measures like this be introduced? Cannot people be innately more responsible and start doing something for the environment? So I don't think we have time for any more questions, so uh, we'll wind up the session. Thank you so much, all of you. We've had a very, very interesting talk on all the issues pertaining to the smart cities. So we are looking at including uh, adjectives like efficient and transparent to the already existing safe and resilient cities. Thank you so much once again. Thank you.